4 is only 11 verses. And I want us to read the entire chapter responsibly. So I will begin with verse number 1 and then um, everybody else alternate, okay? I'll read 1, all of you together read 2, I'll read 3, all right? You get it? All right. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice that I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up here, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardius stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderclaps and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first living creature was like a lion, and the second living creature like a calf, and the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And then, and when those living creatures gave glory and honor and thanks to him that is seated on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Let's all together, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Father, I thank you for your word. We open our hearts and our ears, Lord, to receive from you. As you say consistently in the last three verses, he that chapters, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Father, we open our hearts and our ears to hear what you would say to the church tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, now, um, in chapters 1 through, Sir Henry, you, you have my uh, PowerPoint? In chapters 1 through 3, we saw Jesus on earth walking in the midst of the churches. You remember that? We saw him on earth walking in the midst of the churches. But in chapter 4, listen, the scene changes to heaven. The scene changes to, to heaven. Basically, if we want to outline Revelation, we can say chapters 1 through 3 speak to the churches and that's on earth. And then from chapter 4 on to chapter 18, um, it's it's the scene changes, but chapter 4 and 5, the scene changes from earth to heaven. And after that, up to chapter 18, it's dealing with what I talked about earlier, the transition of power. The transition of power. The transfer of power. Amen? <coughs> and, and, and so, um, we're, we're after chapter 4 and 5, we're going to look at the first quarter of the tribulation, then the second quarter of the tribulation, then the heavenly visions, and then the seven vile judgments, which is the last half of the tribulation. Next slide, Sir Henry. We're doing this quickly. And, and what we're going to have after this is, is uh, 
Jesus' final message. Christ and the future, the last three, four chapters. So we're going to have Christ and his marriage to the church. His marriage to the church. And, and then his glorious appearing. Then his millennial kingdom and judgment of unbelievers. Then creation of new things and his final message. All right, but now let's go back to chapter four. Okay, Sir Henry. So the first thing after the church age, remember in chapters one through three, we talked about the physical churches that were standing at the time when John was writing, but we also saw that they represented successive periods in the history of the church. Now, as we turn to chapter 4, something happens. Verse 1 says, after this, after all of chapters 1 through 3, and talking about the churches, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice that I heard, that is the one that was speaking to him earlier on, um, um, when he fell down as though he were dead, and, and he says, I, I am he that was dead, okay? And he goes on to talk to him about the churches. He said that same voice, the voice that I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up here, and I will show thee things which must be here." After. So the first thing after the church age, we hear Jesus saying to John, come up here. In other words, he was caught up. He was raptured. He said, come up here, glory to God. And he said, immediately I was in the spirit. So it was a spirit that raptured him and took him up, glory to God. Now, Many Bible scholars believe that this fact, that right after the church age, and, and then the next thing John heard was, come up here, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. They, many people take this to mean that this is an indication that the church will be raptured before the great tribulation. Amen? The, 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 this is good. But if this were the only passage that we had to substantiate the pre-tribulation rapture, that would be kind of weak. It wouldn't be sufficient. But, but if we take this idea here, this concept here, this thought here, with other related scriptures, we have a very, very strong argument for getting out of here before the great tribulation. Are you with me here? All right, now, um, Dr. Tim LaHaye in his book uh, entitled Revelation Illustrated and made, made plain, he lists four reasons for believing in a pre-tribulation rapture, that the church will be caught up out of here before the great and terrible day of the Lord, before the abomination of desolation, before the time of Jacob's trouble. He believes the church is going to be gone before that. And I believe that. I believe that is scriptural. That is scriptural to, to believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I am not going to fight with people who don't believe that. I'm going to love them. I'm going to pray for them. Okay? But, but, but I believe that, that it, is, it is solidly biblical. All right. Number one, you're going to get four points right now as to why we believe in the, the pre-tribulational rapture. Um, we're going to be gone before the great tribulation. All right, number one, the location of this scene is in heaven. Remember, he was talking to John on the earth in the previous three chapters. The scene of the previous three chapters is on earth with Christ walking in the midst of the churches. He was commending, remember we had commendation, um, 
counsel where necessary, challenge and rebuking where necessary. We saw that go on for three chapters. But chapters four and five, the scene changes to heaven. And then chapter six introduces the beginning of the great tribulation. And from chapter six right on to chapter 18, that continues. All right? Now, so John was a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was one of the 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, which is the birthday of the New Testament church. All right, now, the inception, the beginning of the church age, and so John being caught up when, when the voice said to him, come up here and I will show you things which be hereafter. John is a symbol of the true church. Are you with me here? John is a symbol of the true church being taken out of the world before the tribulation. Remember, we, we looked in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. There is a promise here. There are several others, but let's look at this one. It says, because, Jesus speaking, because you have kept the word of my patience, check this out, I will also keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. He says, because you have kept my word, you have kept the word of my patience, I'm going to take you out, I'm going to take you out, I'm going to take you out, hallelujah. Yeah. Now, here's something else, we're going to go through some more scriptures in a moment, but here is something else, if you read from chapter 4 on to chapter 18, uh, 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 actually from chapter 6 through chapter 18, there are no references to the church. In chapters 1 through 3, there are 16 references to the church. Okay? Whereas chapters 6 through 18 do not mention the church once. Not even once. That is very strong. Are you with me here? Stay with me, stay with me, don't go away, all right? So, so this would lead us to conclude that the church was absent during the proceedings of chapter 6 through 18, which records the great tribulation. Are you with me here? Is this making sense? Wave at me, talk to me, say hi, hello. All right, glory to God, amen. All right, number three. The strong use of Old Testament language from chapters 4 through 18. The strong use of Old Testament language from chapters 4 through 18. This is an indication that God is now dealing with Israel and not the church. Are you with me here? The church age is the time of the Gentiles. It's the time of the Gentiles, while the great tribulation is the time of Jacob's trouble, or the 70th week of Daniel, and we're going to get into Daniel's 70th week a little bit later on in the study. All right? So the Bible tells us in Daniel that 70 weeks are determined upon the nation of Israel to complete God's dealing with them. And from chapter 4 on, we are going to find uh, Old Testament symbols being used terminology that we're very familiar with in the Old Testament, such as tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the altar, elders, censer, cherubim, seals, judgment, plagues. We're going to find all of those mentioned from chapter 4 through 18. So what we find is a change of, of symbolism, is a change
change of of addressing so it's addressing a different audience it's intended for a different group of people hello all of the the uh addressing of the church we found it in the first three chapters chapters four and five is like a transition and chapter six through eighteen deals with the great tribulation and it goes back to old testament symbolism because as i've said repeatedly the great tribulation is the last uh seven years or seven weeks of years of daniel 70 weeks to complete is scheduled with the nation of Israel. Are you with me here? So as the time of the Gentiles comes to a close, which is after the rapture of the church, God begins to take up his dealing again with the nation of Israel. Amen? So uh, in the Old Testament, the Bible says God is married to Israel. Okay? And and and. The church is the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, so God the Father is going to finish his dealing with the nation of Israel to whom he's married. And he's going to create the new Jerusalem. Are you with me? You still with me? All right. Number four. The language and events of Revelation chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 are very similar to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18. God is amazing, you know. This is the chapter that he used to save me. Especially this part right here. This is what I was curious about, the rapture, amen. And three weeks after my curiosity was speak, he appeared to me in the night vision, in a dream. And I woke up, read the scripture, and was, whoo, gloriously saved for more than 30 years now, amen. I never go to church to get saved. God snatched me out of my bed with his word. And save me, glory to God. So every time I read this, I get all excited. Because I know it's true. I was curious about it. And he used that to save me. Are you with me here? Glory to God. So, the language and the events of Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, are very similar to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. Let's look at those for a moment. In chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice that I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up here, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. Verse 2, and immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Let's jump over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and let's read the last part. Amen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning at verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also who sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, like John heard a trumpet, as it were a trumpet. He descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I don't want you to miss verse 18. The Bible says, Wherefore, comfort, comfort, comfort one another with these words. Listen to me. What comfort is there in saying you're going to get the mark of the beast and go to 
through all the horrific things of the great tribulation, hello, with the Antichrist. What comfort is there in that? There's none. The Bible says right here, comfort one another with these things. The comfort is Jesus is coming back for us. Glory to God. That's the comfort. To be caught away with our bridegroom, our king, the lover of our soul, the one who died for us and shed his blood even while we were yet in our sins. That is comfort. He's coming for you and he's coming for me. Glory to God. When uh, uh, Jerry, Jesse the Plantis was caught up to heaven, he said Jesus was preaching loud. He had like, like big meetings out in the park and he, he's preaching like a wild man and he said, I'm going to get your mama and I'm going to get your daddy and I'm going to get your sons and I'm going to get your... Hey, he's coming back for you. Hey, he's coming back for you and he's coming back for me. Glory to God. Here are some other observations. Genesis chapter 6. Let's turn there, please. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. And this is the story of Noah. Remember Noah? Noah was not destroyed with the rest of the people. Why? Because Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He had never seen rain, but God said to him, it's going to rain 40 days and 40 nights. There's going to be a flood, but I want you to build an ark, and I want you to take your family, and I want you to get two of every living creature, because it's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. Hallelujah. And Noah believed. Even when he was ridiculed. And made fun of. He believed God. And he built the ark. The ark of safety. It was that which would keep him safe. While everybody else was going down. Amen. Glory to God. Because he believed God. Amen. The Bible. And it's in that context in Hebrews 11. 6, where it says. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You see, he rewarded Noah. Noah was a man of faith. He had never seen rain. Some of us would say, God, what are you talking about? Rain, what's that? Ain't no rain coming. There's nothing called rain. No. Noah believed God. He believed that would be, it would be even as God had spoken. At 120 years, he was building the ark. My God. And in due season, just like God said, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Amen. And the same flood that drowned everybody else because Noah was a man of faith and he believed God and he did what he was supposed to do. The same thing that carried everybody away. Just ease Noah on off with his family and everything God told him. And the Bible says after a period of time it rested on Mount Ararat. Noah as a righteous man did not get killed with the rest of the unrighteous because he believed God. I'm here to submit to you. If you believe God and you live according to his word, amen, and be ready and watchful, you're going up, you're not going down. Woo! Glory to God. You have to read that when you go home. I, I went through all of it for you. Amen. Look, look at um, chapter 7, verse 1. Wait, wait a, wait a second. Let's see. Oh, I went into Exodus. No wonder. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 1. Hear what it says. 
And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. He says, come into the ark. Amen? All right. There's one I don't have in my notes, but let, let's see if we can find it. Lot is in uh, 14. 14. So, in Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, God was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Isaac prayed, I mean, Abraham prayed, and said, God, if you find 50, amen, if you find, and he kept going down, going down, going down, and couldn't find any, all right? All he found there was Lot. All right, anyone found that for me? Sodom and Gomorrah, the, the destruction. Nine, 19, okay. Okay, all right. So, and when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, verse 15, and take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. So he brought Lot and his family out. We know the story, Lot's wife turned a pillar of salt because she was lagging behind and looking back. Her heart wasn't fully turned to know that, got to get out of here, got to get out of here. Her heart was back there and she's looking back and dragging her feet. She literally turned a pillar of salt. Are you with me here? All right, now, Matthew chapter 24, let's go there please. Matthew 24, verse 37. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 37, it says, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man. Amen? Verse 36, But at that day and hour, no, no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of, of the Son of Man. All right. And um, we looked at uh, Lot getting out of Sodom. So here we have some scenarios where God pulled his people out before the destruction. We looked at Genesis 6, 5 through 8, verses 17, 18, and chapter 7, verse 1. That was talking about Noah. Then Matthew 24, 37 says, As in the days of Noah, so shall the days of the coming of the Son of Man be. And then Lot was Genesis 19. Uh, you can read the whole thing, but we find it highlighted in 15, 21, 22, 27 through 29. Everybody on board with me? Am I missing anyone? All right, very good. All right, so what we're seeing here is scriptural uh, scenarios that in every instance, God pulled the righteous out. They were not destroyed with the wicked. Amen? Let's look a little bit further at the rapture. Now, people will tell you the word rapture is not in the Bible. And they're right, but the word rapture simply means caught up. And that's exactly what it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, shall be caught up. The Greek word harpazo, and, and, and this is what it means. It means to seize by force, to pluck, to pull up, to take by force. That's the meaning of that word. Caught up. That's what it means. So Christ is coming to rob this world of his jewels. His redeemed ones. Those for whom he gave his life. While we were yet in our sins. 
he gave his life for us. How much more now? Are you with me here? Amen. So, and as I said earlier, comfort. Comfort. There's no comfort in saying, you're going to take the mark of the beast and this and that and the other. No, no, no. That's not where we're to be anticipating. We're to be anticipating the return of the Lord. That's what we're to look for. To those that look for him, will he appear the second time without sin unto salvation? And as he told me back in the 80s, his body was broken once. It will not be broken again. His body was broken once. It will not be broken again. Now, here's, here's another scripture I would like us to read responsively. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. But when you get to 11, you feel like you want to read the rest of it. So, so let's start. This, this, this says a lot. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Everyone, verse 2. Are you, are you with me? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 oh, oh, Thessalonians. Thessalonians. I'm sorry if I say the second. First. Verse 2. Chapter 5, verse 2. To the thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Do, do you see how clear that is? How clear it says, y you know, um, the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. Amen? But it says here, but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Paul was speaking to the church, the church at Thessalonica. So he says, you're not in the darkness. You're now in the light because of Jesus Christ. Alright? So, verse 5. Ye all are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as the rest, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep sleep in the night, and they that are drunk are drunk in the night. Check this out. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but unto salvation by the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and when we're finished with this, I'm going to show you what that word wrath means. All right? Verse 10, guys. Hallelujah. Amen. Again. Just like in the previous chapter, wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Twelve. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. And be at peace among yourselves. In other words, this is the way we should live as we are waiting and anticipating the coming of the Lord. 14. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Pray without ceasing. Quench not the spirit. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. 
And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Faithful is he that call you who is doing. He is faithful to keep us. To keep us. And he's faithful to come and get us before the day of calamity. All right? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10, I'm, I'm going to read a few scriptures for you, and then I'm going to look at that word, wrath. In chapter 1, verse 10, it says, And to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. Are you with me? He's delivered us from the wrath to come. Chapter 2 and verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Th that's those who do not believe. The wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Let us look at Colossians chapter 3 and verse 6. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 6. It says, For which things say, The wrath of God cometh on the sons of disobedience. That word wrath in the Greek is orge. Orge. O-R-G-E. Orge. And here's what it means. It means violent passion or um, I'm Jamaican, so I hear this word all the time, iry, but it's ar, ar, I-R-E, or justifiable abhorrence. So, so you, you, you are justified in abhorring something, in, in being, uh, despising something. In, in, in other words, God is justified in punishing people who reject his son. He's given everyone. Everyone has the opportunity to take that route of escape and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's who the Bible calls wicked. The people who have rejected the goodness of God. The Bible says it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. And when people reject that goodness and reject the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and reject the love and the forbearance of God. Those are termed wicked people. And so this whole idea of wrath implies punishment. It implies punishment. It implies the indignation of God. It implies the vengeance of God. He's not executing vengeance upon the church. He executed that vengeance upon the Lord Jesus Christ. All of his wrath for sin was poured out upon Jesus. But it's those who reject that mercy and that loving kindness and that goodness and that grace, those are termed wicked. And that's who will receive the wrath of God not the church you see this is somewhere in my notes okay right here around the world right now and in this 20th century there have been more people persecuted and martyred for their faith than any other time in history but hear me and hear me well that persecution is not the wrath of God. It's the enemy that's mad when people stand up and testify in the face of no matter what, in the face of death, testify to the truth and the veracity of who Jesus is and what he has done for them. So people are being persecuted for the faith. They're not under the wrath of God. Are you with me here? No. No, no, that's the anger of the enemy. Glory to God. Amen. So, so it's not the wrath of God. However difficult and however 
what suffering they go through is not the wrath of God. The suffering is the anger of Satan as they testify to the reality of Jesus Christ. Are you catching this? Is this making sense? Thank you, Sir Henry. Glory to God. Amen. All right. So, so as we look at the rapture of the church, God is not punishing the church during the great tribulation. He's snatching away believers. He's snatching away the bride of Christ. He's the close of the times of the Gentile. He's the close of the church age. He's the close of the dispensation of grace. During this dispensation, he's dealing with every man, woman, and boy and girl, Jew or Gentile, on the basis of what you have done with Jesus Christ. What have you done with that mercy that I've shown to you? It's equal ground at the cross. It's equal ground at the cross. Level ground at the cross for everyone. All get treated the same way, Jew or Gentile alike. What have you done with Jesus? And so when that age closes, those who act in the same way and reject Jesus, even though the time of Jacob's trouble is for his dealing with Israel, but those who act same in the same manner as rejecting Jesus Christ, they will go through the same issues. <clears throat> it's the same way, like hell was not created for man. It was created for the devil and his angels. But to act like the devil and his angels, unfortunately, they're going to get treated the same way. Are you with me here? God is a just God. He's a God of justice. So in light of the rapture, how shall we live? How shall we live? Soberly. Have your head well screwed onto your body. Watch and pray. We are to live godly. We ought to live obediently, obey, obeying, obeying the word. We ought to live diligently spreading the gospel. We ought to be serving with diligence. Oh, come on. Without Jesus Christ, you have no life. So he exchanged his sinless life for your sinful life and my sinful life. So my whole life is a sacrifice and a service to God. My whole life should be lived serving God. We're to give sacrificially for kingdom purposes. We're to pray without ceasing and love with the love of Christ. In light of the rapture and we're anticipating the return of Jesus, that's how we ought to live. Are you with me here? Yes. Glory to God. All right, now. For the next 10 or 15 minutes or so, I am going to um, go a little bit deeper in uh, chapter 4. I won't, I won't keep you very long. All right, now. So in chapter 4, I love this chapter. Probably one of the chapters I quote more than any other especially the last verse where he has created all things for his pleasure. Now, let's go back to chapter 4 of Revelation and put your shouting shoes on. Put your dancing shoes on and your shouting clothes on. Glory to God. Amen. Now, the central object, I don't want you to miss this, the central object in heaven is the throne of God. Hallelujah. The central object in heaven is the throne of God. The throne of God is referred to eight times in the first six chapters, first six verses of chapter four. Eight times we find the throne of God mentioned in the first six verses. 
All together in chapters 4 and 5, the throne is mentioned 18 times. Listen to me. Uh, in Jamaica, we have a saying, when you talk much, you're beating up your gum. God was not just beating up his gum. He wasn't just talking for the sake of talking. When he says something so many times, hello, he said, pay attention. Pay attention. This means something. This means something. So, uh, remember I said, once we get here and moving forward, we are going to encounter many Old Testament terminology and symbols. So the throne is mentioned very frequently in the Old Testament. I'm just going to cite three examples very quickly. You may want to just write down the references and listen to me as I read them. Uh, first reference we're going to look at is 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 19, talking about the throne of God. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. All right? Psalm 47, 8. It says, God reigneth. Remember we sang earlier, he reigns. God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. We're very familiar with Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord doing what? Sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with Twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, for the whole earth is filled with his glory. So we see three Old Testament references here that talk about the throne of God. So here in chapter 4, it, it's, it's repeating, it's going back to Old Testament terminology, talking so much here about the throne of God. Hear this, the throne of God is mentioned, listen to this, listen, Jesus is coming back to rule and to reign. He's coming back to be king, glory to God. And kings have thrones. So the throne of God is mentioned in every chapter in Revelation except chapters 2, 8, and 9. Except chapters 2, chapter 8, and chapter 9. In verse 3, the one that John sees sitting upon the throne is indescribable in human similarities. He could not describe the one that is sitting on the throne. Look at verse 3. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardius or sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne inside like an emerald. He's just describing what he saw, but nothing in human terminology. Amen? And I'm going to show you how this takes us again into Old Testament symbolism. In Psalm 104, verse 2, the Bible says, God covers or clothes himself with light as with a garment. He clothed himself with light as with a garment. So, so here... We see nothing human, nothing that John could tell us that we could draw any frame of reference from. It's like going to a primitive tribe who has never seen a refrigerator and trying to describe to them what a refrigerator is like. They have never seen a television. Try to describe to them what a television is like. Try to describe to them what an automobile is like. 
you would have no frame of reference. This is what John is seeing here. The one that is seated on the throne, he, he could not describe him. It's like in John 1, 18, no man had seen God at any time. But the only begotten, of, begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. He has declared him. So all John could say, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to stay very long here. I'm, I'm going to let you out on time. Trust me. All right. Turn, please, quick. I want you to see this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 13 to 16. I'm going to read it. Timothy says, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. That thou keep the commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Check this out. Which in his times he shall show. Who is the blessed and only potentate, king of kings and lord of lords. Verse 16. Who only have immortality. And this is the part I want to get to. Dwelling in the light. Which no man can approach unto. Whom no man had seen nor can see. To whom be glory. To whom be honor and power. Everlasting. Amen. He is in the light which no man can approach unto. You can't approach unto to it. You can't see. You can't describe him. So John could not give a description. In human similarities. So here's what John did. He went back to the Old Testament. Are you with me here? He went back to the Old Testament. And all he could say, he was like a jasper and a sardine stone. Now, now you're going to catch this in a minute. You're going to catch this in a minute. And it's all right to run around this place if you want to. You, you, I, I may have to start it. Amen? But... Um, all he could say was like a jasper and a sardine stone. Well, well, the jasper stone as we know it today is, is an opaque stone. But what they knew it as, he was more like a crystal, a brilliant, brilliant stone. And in that day, the crystal was the most brilliant of all the precious stone. So, so it was a jasper and a sardine. The jasper was brilliant like crystal. And the sardine stone was somewhat like a, like a ruby that we would know. So it's blood red. Are you with me here? It is blood red. So here is the picture that John is painting. Okay? The picture of the presence that John saw was like a blinding flash of diamond in the sun that is so brilliant you can't look at it and the dazzling blood red of the sardine stone amen and both of them flashing through this circular rainbow that that's emerald green so so the power and the brilliance of the crystal stone and the blood red is kind of toned down by the green of the emerald rainbow around the throne. Are you catching this? Amen? Well, let, let, me, let me give you um, the, 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 the symbolism in a minute. But when John stand there, the light was unbearable and indescribable. It's, it's the absolute purity of God excluding any impurity. Amen. Can, what, what, can, can you imagine what a diamond would look like with absolutely no impurities, whatever? We're talking heaven. There's nothing impure in heaven. Glory to God. So the blood of the sardine stone stands for the avenging wrath of God. And the green of the emerald of the rainbow speaks of the mercy of God by which alone we could meet his justice. It's true, his mercy.
mercy. Are you with me here? So the sardine and the jasper give us the idea of sacrifice and glory. Sacrifice and glory. Now, something to remember. Most of the first intended reader of the book of Revelation were converted Jews. Remember, the church started out with Jews. Amen? So they understood the symbolism of the Old Testament. All right? So, so here is why this is significant. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. Maybe you want to turn here or you just want to listen to me. And just listen. Exodus 28, 17 through 20. And this was talking about when God was giving Moses the instruction for the breastplate of the high priest. Stay with me now. And thou shalt set in it, this is the breastplate, settings of stone, even four rows of stone. The first row shall be a sardius, mm. a topaz, and a carbuncle, that shall be the first row. So you see these three stones. What is the first stone? What is the first stone? Sardine. The sardine stone or the sardius stone. That's the first stone. All right, now, you can read the rest of it when you get home, but I'm getting down to the last stone. Verse 20, and the fourth row, burial, onyx, and jasper. The jasper is the last stone. Are you with me here? So the first stone in the high priest's blessed prayer was a sardine stone, all right? And the last stone was a, was a jasper stone. Check this out. Remember, these stones were put in there, named after the tribes of Israel. And he told them specifically how to line them up. So the first stone, the sardine stone, was for Reuben, behold the son. Are you with me here? The last stone was the jasper stone for Benjamin, son of my right hand. Hello. So, so what we're seeing here, the one that John saw on the throne was no other than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, enthroned in power and great glory, reigning as high priest, ever living to make intercession for all that would come to God by him, for he's able to save to the uttermost all that would come to God by him. Listen to me, have you come to God by Jesus Christ? He's able. He's able. He's able to save you to the uttermost. Save you to the uttermost. Hello. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Application and I'm done. Where is Jesus Christ at this very moment? At this very moment. Right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. That's what he does, people. He ever lives to make intercession for us. That's where he is right now. And he's seated on the throne, the central place in heaven. Glory to God. And he's carrying out his high priest. Not only that, but remember where you are. He's raised us up, each one of us, and made us priests unto himself to make known the needs of the people to him and to take his goodness to the people. Hallelujah. That's the one that John saw on the throne. He looked like a sardine stone. Behold the sun. And a jasper stone. The son of my right hand. The one risen in power and great glory. And he's coming back to take what is rightfully his. He's coming back and there's going to be a transference of power. It's not going to be a peaceful transference because people don't want to give up what's not rightfully theirs. They don't want to give it up. But it's going down. It's going down. But a lot's going to happen before then because God is not going to lose. The devil won't have more people than God. Amen. So there's going to be amazing revival during the great tribulation. Yes! Hallelujah! Glory to God. Amen.
house.